Now, those who want to live in sin would argue with me and tell me God's mercy is everlasting. His grace and mercy follows me all the days of my life. The Lord said he would never leave me nor forsake me. No, let me give you some Bible. Would you bow and be in prayer with me? Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would journey with me in the Old Testament to the book of Judges, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. In that seventh book of the Bible, if we can collectively navigate our way to the 16th chapter, there's a word from the Lord that sets the tone not only for the message today, but for the next few weeks. As we read about a man who's well known to many of us who've spent any appreciable amount of time in church, a brother by the name of Samson. If you would journey with me to the 16th chapter of the book of Judges, and when you have found the 15th verse, if you're physically able, we ask you to stand with us as we reverence the reading of God's word from Judges chapter 16, beginning in verse number 15. If you found it, won't you say amen? amen. The word of the Lord from the New King James Version of the Bible reads, Then she, meaning Delilah, said to him, meaning Samson, how can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. It came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart. And he said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven... Then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand, and then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man, and he had, and he, excuse me, called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. There they bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Hang out in verse number 20. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. For today and the next few weeks, I want to talk and teach from the subject and the thought, what makes you weak? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. What makes you weak? As I've shared openly with many of you who know, about six weeks ago, after suffering a tear in the patellar tendon of my knee, I had to have reconstructive knee surgery. Kept me out for a few weeks, but I'm proud to tell you today that I'm well on the road to recovery, that I... I'm grateful that I stand before you today with no pain and on no pain medication. Although I've got some oxycodone that I recognize watching documentaries on TV, I can make a lot of money with. I'm on no pain medication. Don't need any crutches, no wheelchair, no cane. Not even wearing the brace on my leg this morning. And I come to tell you that because I want to give thanks for a few things. 
I want to give thanks, first of all, that God is a healer. G. Patterson, who now rests with the Lord, once said that if you can have it, God can heal it. And there's some folk all around this sanctuary and even online who know that God is a healer. I'm thankful to God that he's not only a healer, but I'm thankful to God for the prayers of this church family. For those who lifted me up, I have found the word of God is true, that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. That when praying saints get down on their knees, God does things in your life. And some of us know that God has moved in ways that we didn't pray for, but somebody prayed for us. And I'm grateful to God for the righteous who prayed for me and even the unrighteous who tried. God bless you too. I'm thankful to God that he's a healer. I'm thankful to God for the prayer of the righteous. And I'm thankful to God for physical therapists. Anybody who's ever had a major injury knows that God's healing hands are the hands of some physical therapists. Now, if you've never been, and I pray you never have to go, I do want to let you know that physical therapy, Lawrence will tell you, is hard work. Going in two, sometimes three days a week, and the problem I have is that the tendon they reconnected to my knee is tight and it needs to be stretched. So every time I go to physical therapy, it begins with some intense stretching. And I want to testify that that stretching does not tickle. I thought my therapist was trying to kill me on Thursday. She said to me, she said, Reverend, your knee is tight, and in order to get your full range of motion, we need to stretch it to get your flexibility back. And while I've been going through therapy, I found out that my greatest problem with my knee is not my flexibility. The greatest problem is the atrophy in my quadricep. For those that are not medically minded, let me explain it to you. Before the injury, I had been running and lifting weights, trying to prepare myself to enter a half marathon in the fall. Because of that, my legs were getting stronger. But with six weeks of inactivity in my quadricep, my quadricep has begun to atrophy. It, it's the, the, cliche, the cliche, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And right now I look kind of funny underneath my clothes because my right leg is still strong. But my left leg, my injured leg, has atrophied so much that it's half the size of my right leg. And the therapist has said, Pastor, we've got to get that muscle strong again. Because no matter how strong your good leg is, you'll never rise above the weakness in your injured leg. She said to me, no matter how strong part of you is, you will always be limited by your weakness. Beloved, I'm not trying to give you some knowledge about a knee. I'm trying to teach you a lesson about life. No matter how strong you are in one area of your life, you will never rise above the weakness you suffer with in other areas of your life. I come by to declare to you that God can gift you with great strength. God can favor you with unprecedented opportunity. God can birth you with skills and talents and abilities like none other. God can open door after door after door in your life. But all of us know examples of life of people who had great strengths but were limited by their great weaknesses. For you will never rise above the weakness in your life. Beloved, I come by to tell you that if you don't know anybody whose strength was gainsayed by their weakness, look that word up when you get home. If you don't know anybody whose strength was limited by their weakness, allow me to introduce one to you. His name is Samson. We read about Samson in Judges chapter 13 through chapter 16. When you go home and you reread Judges 13 through 16, you'll find out that Samson is the last judge in Israel. He is from the tribe of Dan. His father's name is Manoah. And Manoah's wife, who's unknown by name, is a barren woman. God, in due time, decides to bless her with a child. And like many barren women in the Bible, the prophecy of her pregnancy is given by an angelic visitation. An angel shows up to Manoah's barren wife and declares 
that she shall become pregnant. And when the angel shows up, he gives her some restrictions about what she can and cannot do, what she can and cannot eat, what she can and cannot drink. And the reason the angel restricts her movement is because God has declared that the child she will have will be a Nazarite. Let the church say Nazarite. Nazarite literally by Hebrew means something that is consecrated, something that is set apart, something that God says has a special purpose for him. And the Lord declares that this child will be a Nazarite. If you go home and you want to read more about Nazarites, you need to go to Numbers chapter 6, and you'll find that any man God deemed to be a Nazarite had some restrictions on his life, three in particular. Number one, he could not touch a dead body. Number two, he couldn't drink anything that contained alcohol. Notice somebody tell him, well, you ain't a Nazarite. You ain't a... <laughs> and number three, he could never have his hair cut. And so when Manoah's son is born, his name is Samson, Samson is deemed to be a Nazarite. He cannot touch a dead body. He cannot drink alcoholic beverages, and he cannot have his hair cut. And the reason God has consecrated Samson is because God has a purpose and a plan for Samson. Samson is to be the military leader to lead the army of Israel in victory against their dreaded foes called the Philistines. And in preparation for that divine assignment, God has gifted Samson with unprecedented physical strength. Anybody who's been to Sunday school, you learned that Samson is the strongest man in the Bible. Samson's so strong that he kills a lion with his bare hand. He's so strong that he takes the jawbone of a donkey and kills 1,000 Philistines. No man has ever defeated Samson. Samson is the strongest man in the Bible. But in spite of all his great physical strength, Samson surprisingly never lives up to the full call of God on his life. Because in spite of his great physical strength, he is hindered by some real weaknesses. Those weaknesses are fully exposed in Samson's relationship with a bad sister named Delilah. D Delilah is one of those biblical names you don't give a child. <laughs> Anyone who reads scripture will never name their daughter Delilah, Jezebel, or their son Judas. To understand Delilah, you got to understand that the Philistines are sick of Samson. They are tired of losing battles to him. They are tired of him destroying their armies. But they realize that they cannot get to Samson through another man because no man can defeat Samson. No, Samson's weakness is not men. Samson's weakness is women. And they know that they can get to Samson through a sister named Delilah. They go to Delilah and they say, look, D, we will give you, we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver if you can just find out where his strength lies. Delilah takes the money and agrees to set up Samson. And she goes to Samson and three times she asks Samson what is the source of his strength. And three times he lies to her. She says, Samson, where does your strength come from? He says, well, baby, if, if, if you tie me up with seven bowstrings, I'll lose my strength. He goes to bed. When he wakes up, he's tied with seven bowstrings and Philistines all around him. He breaks the bowstrings, kills the Philistines. The next night, 
Delilah says, baby, where does your strength come from? <laughs> Sam says, well, if you tie me up with new rope, I'll lose my strength. He goes to bed. When he wakes up, he's tied up in new rope, Philistines all around. He breaks the rope, kills the Philistines. The next night, Delilah says, babe, where does your strength come from? <laughs> Sam says, baby, my strength comes from my hair. If you braid my hair, I will lose my strength. He goes to sleep, he wakes up with his hair braided, Philistines all around, takes the braids out, kills the Philistines. <laughs> and now Delilah flips the script. She says, you don't love me. Because if you love me, brothers, let me just tell you that when your woman says, if you loved me, you about to have to give up something. I'm just letting you know. She, she says, she, she, if, if you loved me, you wouldn't lie to me like that. Samson in love with her says, all right, baby, let me be honest with you. If you shave my head, I'll lose my strength. Now, let me, let me tell you how, how, how trifling Delilah is. So, so when she finds out that, that his hair has to be shaved, the Bible says she puts him to sleep on her knees. Puts him to sleep on her knees. And she calls another man into the house to shave his head while he sleep on her knees. And whatever she did to put him to sleep was so good <laughs> that he didn't even recognize another man was shaving his head. He slept through a haircut. <laughs> and when he wakes up, the Philistines are surrounding him. He wakes up and this is what he says. He says, I ain't worried about that. I've killed Philistines by the dozen. I beat them time after time after time. This is what Samson says. I'm just going to go out and I'm going to beat them like I always have. And the Bible says that he did not know that the Lord was not with him. I want you to hear the depth of that. He did not know that the Lord wasn't with him. Beloved, that, that phrase right there gives to me a frightening reality and a horrible tragedy. The frightening reality is this, that you can live your life in such a way that you wake up one day to discover the Lord is not with you. Oh, I know that frightens you. you. You want me to tell you that you can do whatever you want and God will always have your back. But what this verse reminds us of is that you cannot take grace for granted. And you cannot abuse the mercy of God. You cannot decide to live willfully in sin, disobeying the commandment of God, and just telling yourself that I can do what I want to do because God will always have my back. There can come a time when you find out that God isn't with you. And hear me, it's not because God left you. It's because you have chosen to walk away from God. Now, those who want to live in sin would argue with me and tell me God's mercy is everlasting. His grace and mercy follows me all the days of my life. The Lord said he would never leave me nor forsake me. No, let me give you some Bible. Saul was so disobedient that God says he regretted him and took his spirit. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, he prayed unto the Lord and said, Lord, do whatever you want. But the one thing I don't want you to do is take your spirit from me. And Paul said to the church in Rome that you can be so disobedient that God gives you over to a reprobate mind. You know what that means? That means that you can reach a place where you're so disobedient that God said, listen, listen, since you are dead set on living in sin, I'm going to stay right here. 
and I'm going to let you go out there and do whatever you want to do. And when you get yourself together and you want to repent, you can come back to me, but I will not go with you while you decide to live in sin. That, that you can wake up and find out the Lord ain't with you. That, that's the frightening reality. But here's the horrible tragedy. You ready? He didn't know it. it it's sad for the Lord not to be with you. It's tragic for you not to know it. It's a sad thing to wind up reprobate. But it's a tragedy to think you're righteous when you are reprobate. It, 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 it's a sad thing to wind up in a place where God's hand isn't on you. But it's a tragedy to think that God is still with you when he ain't. It's a horrible thing to live in a life of sin. But it's a tragedy to think that God is with you in your life of sin and blessing you because you are not reaping any immediate consequences because of your sin and you deceive yourself into believing that God must be blessing you because you're still living. He did not know that God wasn't with him. And how appropriate it is that the Pharisees take his eyes out because he's already blind. The question you ought to be asking right about here, how could Samson not know the Lord wasn't with him? How could this man of great strength be so weak? Well, I want to share with you a couple weaknesses of Samson that, that tempt you and I. I'll give you two today and ask you to come back next week for a couple more. And a week after that for a few more. And heck, if the Holy Spirit speaks, maybe the week after that. How is Samson made weak? Well, let me give you two answers today and we'll get on out of here in time for brunch. Number one, Samson is fixated on his feelings, but not focused on the facts. Come on, say with me. He's fixated on his feelings, but he's not focused on fact. If that's too much to tweet, just put it like this. He's in his feelings. And when you are in your feelings without some fact, you will always make bad decisions. Well, watch how this goes down. Delilah asks him three times, what is the source of your strength? And he lies to her. And every time he lies to her, she does to him what he lied about. And when he wakes up, he knows she did it, and she called the Philistines to come get him. She says, where's your strength lie? He says, if you tie me up, he wakes up, he's tied up, he knows who did it. And on top of that, the Philistines are around him. He goes to bed, she says, what's your strength? He says, if you braid my hair, he wakes up, his hair is braided, he knows who did it, and the Philistines are around. I'm trying to tell you that Samson knows this chick ain't no good. She set me up, and she's trying to take my strength, and he knows he can't trust her. That's why he lies to her, because he knows Delilah ain't no good. Now, if he knows that this sister ain't no good, why would he tell her the source of his strength? Come, come on, if he knows what she gonna do, because every time he told her something, that's what she did. If he knows that's what she does, why does he tell her what the real source of his strength is? Because she flipped the script. And she said, if you love me. She made Samson get in touch with his feelings. And in his feeling of love, he ignores the fact that he knows she's no good. But because he's in his feelings, he allows his feelings to cause him to ignore the fact 
and that makes him weak. Listen, let me give you this one for free. The greatest damage done to you in life will never be lies other people tell you. The greatest damage done to you are lies you tell yourself. A fact you ignore, of truth you close your eyes to, of stuff God has shown you but you refuse to accept and receive because of what your heart feels. Hear me, hear me. Having feelings doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. But when you allow your feelings to override fact and truth, that's when you become weak. Now somebody, you're upset with me because you just fell in love with someone and your heart is all warm and bubbly. <laughs> listen, listen. Your feelings can be real, they can be deep, they can be powerful, but feelings are not always true. Feelings are not always accurate. Feelings are not always aligned with fact. Feelings can be misleading and feelings change. You've changed your feeling about the person you sit next to at least two or three times since you've been here. You didn't like them when you sat down, you like them now, and now they're touching their neighbor too much and you wish they'd leave you alone. You, you've changed your feelings over people all the time. And I have said repeatedly that you will drown in a sea of feelings if there's no fact to hold on to. Go and tweet that right. You will drown in a sea of feelings if there's no fact for you to hold on to. Feelings will mislead you. As a matter of fact, let me tell you how I found that out. I read my Bible before I got here. And I found out that there's nowhere in scripture where God spoke to somebody through their feelings. God never revealed his will through emotions. God speaks through his word. God speaks through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God speaks through wise counsel. God speaks through angelic visitation. God speaks in dreams. God speaks through the prophetic word. God speaks through the song. God speaks through evidence in your eyes. God speaks through signs and wonders. But nowhere does God speak through your emotions. You want to know why? Because your emotions can't be trusted. Now, now you're arguing, but I got some scripture. You know this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Come on, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Watch, watch, watch what Solomon says. Lean not to your own understanding. Don't trust your emotions. Don't trust your feelings in the heat of the moment. Don't trust your passions because they won't lead you correctly. But acknowledge God and allow God to direct your path and not your feelings. Every now and then, your feelings need a good dose of some fact. You feel like you can't handle this. But the fact is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You feel like it'll never end, but the fact is weeping only endures for a night and joy comes in the morning. You feel like this is too much, but the fact is all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. You need some fact. And, 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 and you know what Samson needed? Samson needed what all of us need when we're in our feelings. He needed a special kind of prayer. He needs a prayer that goes like this. Now, Lord, you know how I feel. But I'm going to ask you to do me a favor right here. Open my eyes. Don't let me be hoodwinked, bamboozled, or run amok. Share with me the truth of what I'm dealing with. And give me the ability to accept that it is what it is. If it ain't no good, it ain't no good. If she's low down, she's just low down. If he's a liar, he's just a liar. If this thing is over, then it's just over. If it's not for me, then it ain't for me. If I gotta walk away, then I gotta walk away. If you don't want me in it, I won't be in it. God, give me some fact. 
that, that I, I don't want to live life following my feelings. I want to live life following fact. He knows she ain't no good. But he ignores it because he thinks he's in love. And beloved, one of the ways the devil keeps us out of the will of God is through false feelings. Especially being in love. Love. And the feeling of being in love can easily pull you outside of the will of God. Let me prove to you. Let me prove to you. I'm proud to prove to you. Um, I need to see the hand of grown folk. Grown, grown folk. Grown, 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 grown. You pay your own bills. You go to work every day. Grown folk. Grown folk. And gr grown folk. Grown folk won't confess this, but they know it's true. Everybody who's grown has done something stupid because you thought you were in love. Everybody in here has done something stupid feeling you were in love. You gave yourself to somebody who wasn't no good because you felt you were in love. You spent thousands of dollars on somebody that could never pay you back because you were in love. You were so in love, you and your girlfriend got in the car, drove by his house, and stayed out there till 3 in the morning just to see who came out the door because you were in love. The feeling of being in love will cause you to ignore fact. Samson's weak because he's fixated on his feelings and not focused on the fact. Can I give you number two? This one ought to hit somebody. The reason Samson is weak is because his desire for Delilah was deeper than his devotion to God. Boy, I could open the door to church right there. The, his desire for Delilah was deeper than his devotion to God. Samson's real problem, y'all, is idolatry. And for somebody in this place, you don't see it because you think idolatry is when you worship another god. No, that's not idolatry. Idolatry is when you give anything or anyone more priority, attention, devotion, and resources of your life than you give to God. Come on, get this right. Idolatry. It's not you bowing down at some graven image. Idolatry is when you give anyone or anything greater priority, attention, resources, and devotion of your life than you give to God. You know what that means? Your job can be an idol. If you prioritize work over worship, you've got an idol problem. Your working out every day can be an idol. Because some people are more committed to getting up at 5 a.m. to go to the gym, but can never get up early to go pray. You, you know what that means? Your children can be an idol. You always got money to buy them the latest clothes, but you can't tithe when you come into the house of the Lord. Social media can be an idol. First thing you do in the morning is check who retweeted you, who liked your picture on Instagram, and what new post you got on Facebook. You have an idol problem. And relationships can become an idol. When you put the person you think you love above your relationship with the Lord, you've got an idol problem. And the problem with Samson, he never worships, he never gives God thanksgiving for his victories. He never kneels down before the Lord. Samson only prayed once at the end of chapter 15 when he was thirsty and demanded that God give him water. He does not have a relationship with the Lord. Samson puts more energy into chasing women than pursuing God. Sam Samson was the original member of parliament. Why must I? 
Jeff, you ain't saved. Be like that. Why must I? Help me, Holy Ghost. Hey, hey. And I finally figured out why Samson could not discern that God wasn't with him. Here's why Samson couldn't discern God. Because he didn't desire God. He wanted Delilah. And your desire can distort your discernment when your deepest desire is not for God. Say that again, Pastor. Your desire can distort your discernment when your deepest desire is not for God. Hear, hear me. You want to know who God shows himself to? Those who desire to see him. You want to know who God reveals his will to? Those who pray for God to show his will. You want to know those whom God speaks to clearly? The ones who hunger to hear God speak in their life. You've got to have a desire for God. The Bible says you will find God when you search for God with all your heart. That God wants those who love him with all their heart and all their mind and all their soul. You got to hunger for God. And the problem with some of us is that we are so full of Delilah that we have no desire for God. Here's what the Lord says and I'm done. That how much of God you have in your life is only set by how deeply you desire him. God is not playing a game with you where God is trying to hide himself or hide his will. God says you can have as much as you desire. Okay, let me help you. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I'm, I'm, I'm a foodie. And I, I, like, I like fine dining. A amen. I like good dining. No, I ain't talking about where they bring all your food. I want, I want courses. Dean Johns, I like the restaurants that, that after I'm done with one course, they come and wipe the crumbs off the table. And they take a fork I ain't even used and pick it up and put down another clean one. I, I, Y'all need to get out more. I like, I like fine dining. I like good food. But you may be surprised to know that I also have a, uh, I have a liking for buffets. <laughs> and you know, it's partially my parents' fault. So some, some, some of you are too young to know about this, but I was raised at Sizzler. <laughs> we didn't go to Ruth's Chris. We went to the Ponderosa. <laughs> Got the all-you-can-eat fried shrimp and steak special on Fridays. I, I, like, I like buffets so much that when I got down to college in North Carolina, every Sunday after church, we would go to, a, well, I, I, you know, I really got to be honest, the Sundays we went to church, uh, we would go over to South Square Mall to a buffet called Piccadilly. Now, if you ain't never been to Piccadilly, my deepest condolences to you. But there's some of us who know God lives in Piccadilly. We used to love sitting down at Piccadilly. But, but now that I've been upgraded, I, um, I really don't like buffets too much because they, uh, they, they really don't match my palate for fine food. So, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of old country buffet. You probably never find me at Golden Corral. Unless I'm with a group of church folk, I'm taking them out. You know, just... Can't take the saints to Ruth's Chris, amen. <laughs> like buffets because they really don't meet my, my, my desire for good food. So a little while ago, Deacon Robinson, I was, I was, I was traveling and um, I, I got stuck in a city uh, between Arizona and California. It was 
I went, I went out west, and, and I, got, I got stuck for four days and three nights. Uh, had a long layover in a, uh, in a city out west, somewhere between Arizona and, and California. Um, and, and while I was stuck there for, for four days and three nights, I, um, I checked in to the hotel that I was staying at. And, and when I checked into the hotel at the city, somewhere between Arizona and California, the concierge said to me, he said, Dr. Wesley, you need to try the buffet. Now, you know, I ain't checking as reverend. I, I just left that here. I, <laughs> you, you don't take reverend with you everywhere, you understand? <laughs> so, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out west somewhere between Arizona and California. I checked into the hotel, and the concierge said, Reverend, Reverend, Doctor, you got, you, got, you got to eat at the buffet because uh, the buffet is the best on the strip, uh, the best in the city, and you, 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 don't judge me. So, so he said, listen, you got to eat the buffet. I said, listen, man, I'm not a big buffet fan anymore because, you know, buffets don't match my fine dining. He said, no, no, this is the buff best buffet in the city. You got to try it. Uh, so, so I got up that next morning. It really wasn't the morning. It was kind of like late afternoon. I went down to the buffet, sat down at the buffet, and I looked, y'all, this is the biggest buffet I've ever seen in my life. They've got some of everything. They've got pancakes and waffles. They've got eggs and omelets. They've got prime rib. They've got sliced turkey. They've got Asian food. They've got Italian food. They've got Tex-Mex. They've got everything you want down there. So I grabbed my plate, and I went around, and I grabbed what I wanted to try. I sat down and ate it, and it was some of the best food that I've ever had in my life. So you know what I did? I got up and I got some more. <laughs> I brought it back, sat down and ate it, and it was so good, you know what I did? I got up and I went and got some more. And by that time, I'm feeling kind of full, but it was so good that I didn't leave. I sat there and waited for my food to digest because it was so good that I'm not leaving right away. I'm going to get as much of this as my body can handle. And the good thing about a buffet is that you can have as much as you can digest, you can eat until you can't eat no more. And that's what God says about your relationship with him. You can have as much joy as you want to have. You can have as much God in you as you want to have. You can have as much power as you want to have. You can have all you want. Would you just nudge somebody and say, you just got to want it. And here's what I found out about that buffet. When you get up and you want some more, you can't take your plate that has food left on it. No, no, not at a good buffet. At a good buffet, they won't put new food on an old plate. They make you get a clean plate that has nothing on it because they said we can't put new food on a plate with some old scraps. That if you come and there's too much stuff on your plate, you can't get what they have for you. If you want it, you got to come with an empty plate. You got to come with an empty cup. You got to come with an empty heart and say, God, I come empty, not full of the world, not full of relationship, not full of career, but empty. And my prayer to God is that he would fill my cup, Lord. That I, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven Feed me till I want no
more. Here's my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. Do you know that? Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Can you stand and let's just sing that together? Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of Yeah.